Well, this morning we're returning to um, Jesus' prayer in John chapter 17, uh, His high priestly prayer for the church, His prayer for us, and again, realizing that this is the reason why we will see heaven. This is the reason why while we're in this world, we're going to be protected. Uh, this is the work of our Lord Jesus Christ as our mediator, making sure that we will arrive in glory. Now, this, this morning we're going to look just at one verse, and this one verse is, is so full that it's going to take up the entirety of our time. This evening we're going to look at the last two verses of this particular prayer, but again, I've already told you what uh, we're going to be looking at this morning in this text. It has to do with Jesus' prayer that we would be in heaven one day to see His glory, and I think you already have some idea of what it is he's talking about, but we're going to look at it a little bit more closely. Let me begin by reading the verse, verse 24 of John 17. Jesus prays, Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, be with me where I am, so that they may see my glory, which you have given me, for you loved me before the foundation of the world. I hope the Lord, by His grace, will show us what a blessing it will be to be able to see that glory that He speaks of here this morning. Now, Jesus has been praying that His Father would preserve us, preserve us so that we might eventually make it to heaven. First of all, by protecting us from a world that hates us, even as that world hated Him, because the Lord, by His Holy Spirit, has made us like Him, and the world hated Jesus. And because the message that we're bringing, that all have sinned and are under God's judgment, but yet God is willing to pardon, He is willing to forgive if they will only turn from their sins and receive His Son, the same message that Jesus brought to them is an offensive message. Jesus prays for our protection because the world's going to hate us because we act like Jesus and because we speak like Jesus. In today's terms, we're not going to be politically correct. We have to go against the stream. That's just the way it is. The world's going to hate us. Jesus prays for our protection. Now, notice again, Jesus did not pray that the Father would take us out of the world because we have a work to do, and that work is in this world. Rather, He prays that the Father would protect us while we're here. Now, secondly, He prayed that the Father would preserve us by protecting us from ourselves, from the sin that's in our hearts, so that we would not be tempted by the world and fall under its power as we engage the world with the gospel. He also prayed that we would be sanctified within so that we wouldn't be so focused upon ourselves and our own comforts that we wouldn't be willing to make the sacrifices that are necessary in order to bring the gospel to the lost and the dying. There is a sacrifice that's involved and we must be willing to make it or the people who are around us will perish in their sin. So Jesus prays that we would be sanctified, that we would desire these things so that we would move forward with this work. And finally, Jesus prayed for our unity, that uh, God the Father, by His Holy Spirit, would subdue within our hearts that sin of division that is in our hearts. I mean, just look around us at the church. And remember last week, I, I told you some of my own personal experiences, how often Christians divide. Uh, all the denominations that we have, even within one denomination, all the differences of opinions, all the irre irreconcilable uh, spirits that we, we seem to encounter. Well, Jesus prayed the Father would subdue that and overcome that sin of division in our hearts and give us the same love and concern for one another so that we would be one body, so that we would be one church, so that the world would have a living example of the truth and the power of the gospel. You know, there's very few people in the world that can really get along with one another. I mean, even, <clears throat> excuse me, within the church. What would it look like to the world if they saw <clears throat> a vast society of people from every culture 
and every part of the world, all getting along together, all working together, all loving each other with the kind of love that Jesus had for us. Remember, Jesus said, I want you to love one another even as I have loved you. What if the world saw a vast society of people that have all these differences from where they come from and their cultures and everything else, and yet loving each other and working together in the way that the Lord has called us to do? What an incredible testimony that would be to the reality and the power of Jesus Christ and His gospel. But that is exactly what Jesus desires. Now, finally, in His prayer, Jesus is going to make one last petition. That's what we're going to look at this morning. And this evening, we're going to look at what I think amounts to reasons that the Lord gives to enforce these petitions, reasons why His Father should answer these petitions. Well, the last petition he prays for is for our glorification. Now, the last two requests that Jesus made had to do with our sanctification. This one has to do with our glorification. Uh, Matthew Henry points out that there is a pattern here, that the Lord always sanctifies before He glorifies. He always prepares us for heaven before He brings us to heaven. That's why He gave us His Holy Spirit, to sanctify us, to make us holy, that we might fall out of love with sin, with, with again, the thing God hates, the things that He hates, and uh, the things that are hateful toward men, and that we might actually fall in love with Him. The Bible says that if we have the Holy Spirit, that work of sanctification will be going on in our lives, and it's a work that we are also involved in. John writes in his first letter in 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 through 3, and, and listen to what he says here. See how great a love the Father has bestowed on us, that we would be called children of God, and such we are. For this reason, the world does not know us, because it did not know Him. Beloved, now we are the children of God, and it has not appeared as yet what we will be, we know that when He appears, we will be like Him because we will see Him just as He is. And note these last words. And everyone who has this hope fixed on Him purifies himself just as He is pure. You see, this is something that will go on in the Christian. This is something that must go on in the Christian. If you are looking for the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ and have that hope that when He appears, you will be transformed into, into His image, you will be purifying yourself just as He is pure because your desire will be to be just like Him. The work of sanctification goes before glorification. So having prayed for our sanctification, Jesus now goes on in verse 24 to pray for our glorification, knowing that the Father is going to answer the first petitions to sanctify us. He says again in verse 24, Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me be with me where I am so that they may see my glory which you have given me for you loved me before the foundation of the world. Now, let's look at three things from this particular verse. First of all, let's look at Jesus' request for our glorification, that one day we will be with Him in heaven. Secondly, why Jesus prays His purpose, that we might see His glory. That's why He wants us to be in heaven. And by the way, that is not self-centered on the part of Jesus. He knows that that is a blessing to us that will actually make us very happy. And then thirdly, the two reasons why the Father will answer this prayer, because Jesus loves us, and because His Father loves Him. So first of all, let's consider His request that we might be with Him in heaven. Jesus prays, Father, I desire that they also whom You have given me be with me where I am. Now, I want you to notice again, first of all, that Jesus does not pray for the world. He prays for those whom the Father has given to Him. He prays for the elect for those who belong to Him, who are known by the fact that they're trusting in Him and are growing into His image. 
Now, again, if these things are true of you, that means that Jesus was praying for you, that Jesus is praying for you. Now, He prays that we, then, might be where He is. Now, not where He was at that time in the upper room with the disciples, but where He would soon be, which is in heaven. Now, let me just, again, remind you that this was the eve of Jesus' betrayal. It was really going to be later that night or early in the morning that Jesus would be arrested, that He would be put on trial, that He would be condemned, that He would be handed over to the Romans for crucifixion. It was shortly after that that He would be on the cross. As a matter of fact, on that very day, nailed to the cross with our sins imputed to Him, facing His Father's judgment for our sins where His blood would be poured out to atone for our sins. Then Jesus would be buried. And he would be raised again on the third day. And then after 40 days more, he would ascend into heaven where the Bible says he is now ruling and reigning until he returns to raise all the dead, to gather all the living together for the final judgment. Now, what Jesus is praying here is that we would be where he is after this work is done, when he is in heaven, that we would be with him when our purpose in this world is finished, that we would be taken up with Him into heaven before the final judgment and then after the final judgment that we might be with Him forever in the new heavens and the new earth. This is God's goal for us. The goal of redemption is that we might be glorified with our Lord Jesus Christ in heaven. Uh, In Romans chapter 8 verses 28 through 30, we see what's basically called the golden chain. Uh, this string of events that takes place that begins with God's foreknowing or foreloving us that culminates in glorification. And the idea here is the chain cannot be broken. If God has foreloved you, He will bring about His desired end, which is glorification. Paul writes this, For those whom He foreknew, He also predestined to become conformed to the image of His Son, so that He would be the firstborn among many brethren. And these whom He predestined, He also called. And these whom He called, He also justified. And these whom He justified, He also glorified. Now, when we are finally called to leave this world by the Lord in His timing, we will be fully transformed into His image. We will enter into that perfect world of love and peace and happiness where we will be with Him forever. This is what Jesus was praying for, that we would be with Him. But there's a purpose behind this petition of our being with Him in heaven. And the purpose is that we might see His glory. Again, let's read verse 24. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me be with me where I am so that they may see my glory, which you have given me. Now, this glory that our Lord Jesus is talking about here is the same glory that he had earlier prayed for in this same prayer in verses 4 and 5. He says to the Father, I glorified you on the earth, having accomplished the work which you have given me to do. Now, Father, glorify me together with yourself with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Now, again, we we looked at this before when we looked at this passage. As Jesus humbled himself and became a man, in a certain sense, he gave up the glory that was his. It was veiled in flesh. Now, he did not give up the glory of his divine nature. His divine nature was still endowed with his glory. It could not change. It could not lose anything. But in his humanity, he did not possess this glory glory. So here he prays that the Father again would clothe him as the God-man with this glory, and he prays that we would be there to see it. Now, the verb tense of the word see in the original language, in the Greek language, means or has the the force behind it of, of continual gazing at, that we would not just catch a glimpse of it, that we wouldn't see it for just a short time, but that we might look at it for the rest of eternity. 
Now, one thing we need to think about is, why is that important? Why was it important to Jesus that we see it? Is this, we, we realize that Jesus is not some sort of a, you know, egotistic kind of a, of a being who just wants people to gaze at Him because He wants people to look at Him. But He's asking this because of the blessing that it will be to us. This, above everything else, is what makes heaven actually glorious, what makes heaven to be heaven. It's what makes the saint want to be in heaven, to see the divine glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Jesus is the glory of heaven. That's one thing we need to understand. John, when he was speaking of that, of, of that world the Lord was going to bring following the judgment, writes in Revelation 21, verses 22 and 23. He says, I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb are its temple. And the city has no need of the sun or of the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God has illumined it, and its lamp is the Lamb. The idea here is a, a world without natural light, but it has the light of God's glory which permeates that world day and night, if we can use that terminology because it really isn't day and night anymore, but let's just say continually. The glory of God is shining and the, the, the Lamb is the lamp that shines. The author to the Hebrews writes in Hebrews 1 verse 3 regarding Jesus, and He is the radiance of His glory and the exact representation of His nature and upholds all things by the word of His power. Jesus is the lamp from which the glory of God shines. He is the radiance of God's glory, which basically means He will be glorious to see. Now, this, what we're talking about here, is what the saints have called, or what Christians have called throughout the centuries, the beatific vision, which essentially means that blessed or sublime or glorious sight of God. And here's, here's where words fall short. I mean, it's represented to us as lights. You know, it's, they don't need the sun, don't need the moon because they're illumined by the glory of God and certainly there is a luminescence about it. Those who saw the glory of God have seen, you know, at least these, these visible representations have seen things that are, that are glowing, that have light involved in them. But there's something more than that because people saw that who never saw any beauty in it. There is, a, there is a sight of the beauty of the glory of these things which really cannot be described but can only be experienced. There's really no way you can describe this in a way that will make it attractive to somebody who has never actually seen it. Jonathan Edwards tells us that it's, it's like trying to describe, and I think these analogies are perfect. It's like trying to explain color to somebody who has been blind their entire life. Or trying to describe the beauty of music, at least in, well, in, in symbols or in written way, to a person who's deaf, who has never heard music. Now, they have no point of reference. They have no way of knowing what you're talking about because they've never seen or experienced it because they don't have the sense or the particular senses they need to perceive it. A blind man can know nothing of color, a deaf man can know nothing of music, and in the same way, when you try to describe this to somebody else, they'll have no idea what you're talking about because they do not have the faculty to, to see it or hear it or to experience it. They have nothing to compare it with. The only way that you can know what it is is to see it yourself, is to experience it yourself. And if you're a believer here this morning, you have seen it. If you know Jesus as your Savior, if you love Jesus, if you're following Him because you love Him, the reason you're doing these things is because you have seen it, because the Spirit of God has shown you these things. He's revealed to you this glory, the beauty of this glory. Now, the Spirit of God hasn't given you a full view. He's only given you a glimpse of it. It's like that down payment of the Holy Spirit. We have a taste, a foretaste of heaven, but we don't have the full experience. But you see, that glimpse of the glory of God was all that you needed to change the direction of your life forever, to move you from the heart to follow Jesus 
all the way to heaven. Now, I don't know if you <clears throat> saw this, but when we sang that hymn, The Sands of Time Are Sinking, Samuel Rutherford was describing that very thing to us. Now, I thought I would quote for you a few verses from it, and three of these actually come from the four verses we sang, and one of them comes from the other 17 verses that are a part of this hymn. Uh, I'm not going to read 17 verses, I'm just going to read four verses. So, just try to understand what Samuel Rutherford is saying here. He's, he says this, O Christ, He is the fountain, the deep, sweet well of love. The streams of earth I've tasted, I think he means by that, that glimpse of the Holy Spirit, that down payment, more deep I'll drink above. There to an ocean fullness, His mercy, his mercy doth expand, and glory, glory dwelleth in Emmanuel's land. This glory, you see, is what Jesus is praying that we would be able to see. The king there in his beauty without a veil is seen. It were a well-spent journey, though seven deaths lay between. The lamb with his fair army doth on Mount Zion stand, and glory, glory dwelleth in Emmanuel's land. I shall sleep sound in Jesus, filled with his likeness, rise to love and to adore him, to see him with these eyes. Between me and resurrection, but paradise doth stand. Then, then for glory dwelling in Emmanuel's land. By the way, the, the, the three of the four verses are focusing, well, all four of these are focusing on the glory of Christ, but every single verse focuses on that glory. And this one, I believe, is the closing verse of the, the version in our hymnals. The bride eyes not her garment, but her dear bridegroom's face. I will not gaze at glory, but on my King of grace. I think he means not my glory, not the glory of other things, but the glory of Christ. Not at the crown he giveth, but on his pierced hand. The Lamb is all the glory of Emmanuel's land. And I think I'm beginning to see now what Rutherford is actually talking about here. The Lamb is the lamp from which the glory of God shines. He is the glory. He's, Jesus prayed that He would grant to Him that glory, the glory that is the Father's and it was the Son's from all eternity, and He becomes, as it were, as the God-man, that lamp from which this glory shines where we may see it and be blessed. Now again, this is something that you have to see to understand. And if you've seen it, then you will desire it, just like Rutherford, perhaps not to this degree, but you can to this degree if you will sanctify your lives and set them apart and, and get away from those things that quench and grieve the Spirit of God. Now, I thought I would give you another example. Bernard of Clairvaux wrote a hymn called Jesus, the Very Thought of Thee. It's actually in our hymnal. That hymn goes on for some 15, 20 verses as well. And these few examples of verses that I have here are in that portion that are not in our hymnal. But listen to what he expresses. O Jesus, King most wonderful, Thou conquer renowned, Thou sweetness most ineffable, in whom all joys are found. Again, the idea, you see this glory, your heart goes out after it, this idea of sweetness. Jesus is sweet to those who love Him. Jesus is a source of joy to those who find Him by God's grace. When once thou visitest the heart, then truth begins to shine, then earthly vanities depart, then kindles love divine. O Jesus, light of all below, thou font of living fire, surpassing all the joys we know and all we can desire. O Jesus, thou the beauty art of angel worlds above, Thy name is music to the heart, inflaming it with love. Celestial sweetness unalloyed, who eat thee hunger still, who drink of thee still feel a void which only thou canst fill. The idea is once you've tasted of Christ, the only thing that will satisfy is Jesus. The things of the world will no longer satisfy because they're, no longer, they're, they're not nearly as beautiful or as desirable. They're nothing in comparison. Now, if you love Jesus this morning, the reason you love Him is because the Spirit of God has revealed Jesus' glory to you. That's what He does in the new birth. 
as we read this morning from 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And if He has revealed that glory to you, you will want more of that glory. And because you do want more of it, you will continue to press forward until you see the fullness of that glory in heaven. Now, Jesus prayed that we might be with Him in heaven, not only that we might enjoy the blessings of that glorious world, which is full of love, joy, and peace, and so forth, but that we might be blessed in beholding His glory. And as we behold it, that we would be transformed into that same image from one glory to the next. Not that we are going to reflect divine glory, but that we're going to become more like the Lord Jesus by beholding the beauty of His divine glory. Something we see in this world now, which is transforming us. The more we see it, the more we are transformed into His image. But when we get to see it in its fullness in heaven, we will even be transformed more fully into that image. And that transformation is one that's going to go on throughout all eternity because we'll never reach perfection. And we'll never see the full glory of Christ, as it were, and understand it fully, but we'll learn a little bit more and a little bit more. And as we do, we will continually be transformed more and more throughout all time. Now, finally, let's consider the two reasons that the Father will answer this prayer of Jesus. The first is because this is what Jesus prays. This is what He wants. Again, look at verse 24. Father, I desire, see Jesus is expressing His will, His, His, His want, His love. I desire that they also whom you have given me be with me where I am so that they may see my glory which you have given me. He wants us to have this blessing of seeing His glory. And the reason He wants us to have it is because He loves us. Remember what um, John wrote in John 13, verse 1, as the preface to this, what we're now seeing is the end of the Upper Room Discourse, which was closed with this prayer. He said at the very beginning, Now before the feast of the Passover, Jesus, knowing that His hour had come, that He would depart out of the world to the Father, having loved His own who were in the world, He loved them to the end. Now, we are His own who are in the world. Jesus offered this prayer not just for those disciples who were there, but for everyone whom the Father had given to Him. This is His wish. This is His desire. And since He's done everything that is necessary for His desire to be fulfilled, He asked that the Father might grant this request, which is really a repetition of what He prayed earlier in verses 1 and 2 of His high priestly prayer. He said this, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that the Son may glorify you, even as you gave Him authority over all flesh, that to all whom you have given Him, He may give eternal life. Jesus is the one who gives the Spirit, who gives the glimpse, who gives us this hunger for heaven. Jesus is the one who gives us this because He loves us, and He prays that we would not only get this glimpse, but that we would see the full Uh, revelation of that glory in heaven, this is what Jesus wants, and this is what He has paid for. And so He asks that the Father would glorify Him, that He might glorify the Father. Lord, give me the strength to carry this out, so that I may save these people whom You've chosen, that You intend to give to me, so that You may bring them to heaven. This is what Jesus is praying for, that we might actually see that glory. This is what He wants, and this is what the Father is willing to give to Him. Now, the second reason the Father is going to hear and answer this prayer is because the Father loves His Son. Again, look at the end of verse 24. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me be with me where I am, so that they may see my glory which you have given me, for you loved me before the foundation of the world. Because the Father has always loved Jesus, He has given Him this glory. And because He loves Him now, He will answer His request to bring us where we can see it for the rest of time. So we are going to see it because Jesus has done what's necessary, because this is what Jesus wants, because the Father loves His Son and has given us to Him as His reward so that we might be able to see His glory and love Him and worship Him throughout all eternity. 
Now, in closing, let me ask just a couple of questions. Have you seen the glory of Christ? Has the Spirit of God given you that glimpse of that glory so that you now want to see it in its fullness? If He has, then you will see it. You will be blessed in heaven forever with this view of Christ because Jesus loves you, because He has prayed for you, because the Father has heard Him and granted His Son that request. You will see it because that's what Jesus wants. That's what He's asked. And because the Father is more than willing to give Jesus what He wants. You're going to see it. So you have that hope to look forward to. It's real, a real hope. And it's what keeps us moving forward, the hope of seeing the whole thing. But if you haven't seen it, if you haven't trusted Jesus, if your life shows that you haven't because basically you're unchanged, you're still like the people of the world, going the way of the world, doing the things of the world, loving the things of the world because you don't have regard for the Word of God, you don't listen to what it says, you don't do what it says. Well, then you need to look to Jesus because it's only by seeing what it is that Jesus is talking about here that your life is going to be changed. And the only way that you can see what it is that He's talking about here is if the Spirit of God opens your eyes and reveals it to you. So if you're not trusting the Lord Jesus Christ, and if your life shows that you're not because you are not transformed and being transformed into that image from one level of glory to the next, look to Jesus. He's the one who can open your eyes. He's the one who can change your heart. He's the one that can show you this glory and give you a love for this glory so that you will trust Him and that you will follow Him to heaven. Well, let's, let's bow in a moment of prayer and let's ask that the Lord would, would help us to see where we're at and that we would respond accordingly. Let me just simply say this too, because we are going to be coming to the Lord's table in a moment. The Lord's table is for those who have seen the glory of Christ, for those who have trusted Him, for those who are following Him, for those who have regard to His Word, who love His law, and who are following Him because that is what is in their heart to do. Now, if that's what the way you are, it's because, again, the Lord has already shown you His glory, and you will see His glory in heaven. The table will remind you of that. But this table is not for those who have not seen the glory of Christ, who have not trusted the Lord Jesus Christ, who are still going the way of the world, who have no regard for the Word of God or for just bits, bits and pieces, but not the whole thing. You need first to repent and trust in the Lord Jesus before you come to the table. So let's examine ourselves in light of this, what we've just seen, examine our experience and see what it is, that, where we're at with the Lord. Let's respond accordingly. Thank the Lord for His mercies. If, if we have seen that glory, again, renew our covenant with the Lord and our love for Him as we prepare to come to His table. Let's pray that God would reveal His glory to us more because the way He reveals it, the way we see it, is through what God has commanded in His church, through the worship, through the Word, through prayer, through the sacrament of the Lord's table. Let's pray that He would show us more of that glory, and if you haven't trusted Him, pray that He would change your heart, show that glory to you.